Hello and welcome to the Undressing the Spirit podcast, where sex and spirit go hand in hand. Join me, Tamara Powell, on a no-holds-barred adventure into the psyche and beyond every conceivable limit. Welcome back to Undressing the Spirit. How the hell are you? I hope your week is kicking off to a great start. And thank you. No, seriously, thank you for spending some time with me today. It is an honor to hold sacred space for you. Speaking of sacred space, that's kind of what today's episode is all about. My guest, Clay Cockrell, and I are both passionate about being sacred space holders, not only for our traditional counseling clients, but also for other coaches, creatives, entrepreneurs, healers, and even millionaires in the industry. Both Clay and I believe that it is vital to have someone to hold sacred space with you, for you to be able to explore and process. And we know firsthand how difficult it can be to find someone like that for you when you're so busy being that for everyone else around you. So here's my encouragement for you today. It may be that Clay or I are a good fit for you, or it could be that you find someone else, but truly Look around and see if you can find a good fit for you. Clay and I would be honored. I know I speak for both of us. Feel free to head on over to ariatherapy.com, spelled A-R-Y-A, or walkandtalk.com. That's Clay's website. And see if our bios speak to you. With that said, let me tell you all about my man, Mr. Clay Cockrell. He's one of my most favorite human beings on the planet, and you'll know why very shortly. Clay is a psychotherapist that is based in New York City. He is the founder of Walk and Talk Therapy, where he meets with his clients in Central Park instead of in an office. How fucking cool is that? It almost makes me want to move back to New England. He is an online marriage counselor connecting with his clients via HIPAA compliant platforms. That's important. He'll explain why in a minute. To have online couples counseling over the internet to improve and repair their relationships. Recently, he has launched the online counseling directory, which if you're not a part of, you should be. I am. This is a listing of online therapists all over the world and has the goal of connecting clients in need with the trained and certified therapists that can meet their needs. It's also an educational platform, including podcasts that works to inform therapists on the ethical and legal requirements for doing telemental health. Besides that, like I said, this man has stories for days and he is so warm and inviting. I could talk to him for hours. So without further ado, I give you Mr. Clay Cockrell. Hey, Clay, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. I've been so excited for like the last week getting ready for this. Me too. Super giddy. So uh, my listeners don't know this yet, but we actually met online and then I got to be a guest on your show first. Yes, early days. (laughs) Does it feel like that long ago already? I guess it is. Yeah, yeah. It's been a while now. I me, why me? Just it escapes me sometimes. So the way that we met and what we were talking about was you started this really cool online counseling directory, which for another clinician like me has been fantastic. Yeah, it was out of a need, really. Uh, I'm uh, I'm a therapist. Uh, do couples counseling online, which you know so many people now are living apart, or they maybe they fell in love and they live in different cities. Military families, you know, the husband or the wife could be deployed. And so this was really the only way that they could get any kind of counseling. So then when I was working with one of them and and realized they really needed a referral for individual therapy, there was no bucket of therapists out there that go research and and find somebody for them uh, like Psychology Today. Uh, Psychology Today has a great directory. Every freaking therapist in the world, well, in the U.S. and Canada, Mm -hmm. are listed on uh, Psychology Today. But there's no directory for therapists who are doing telemental health uh, online work. So I went and made one. So now we've got therapists all over the world who uh, work online are listing their practices there. And people who are looking for an online therapist can find them. 
Woo woo. I've already sent so many people that way. They're like, hey, Tamara, do you know someone in uh, New Mexico? I'm like, no, but you know who does? <laughs> <laughs> Let me send you to this directory and you can find your own. It's been fantastic. Oh, it has been so cool to get to know because then I, I, I talk with the people who sign up because, mm-hmm. you know, they're paying me money once a month. And I want to know them and to get to know different therapists around the world, their approaches, their journeys. And, you know, I've had some of them on my podcast and it's just really cool to get to know the people in my field. Yes, that's right. Oh my God. I'm not that old. It's starting to come back to me now, Clay. Thank you. So that I remember now I was stunned when you actually sent a personal email back when I signed up and I was like, what? It's a live person. (laughs) Yeah. It's a live guy sitting in his office in New York, just kind of going on Google and finding people and say, Hey, I like what you're doing. This is what I'm doing. And most of the people just think that I'm some corporation or yes. robot or something I'm like, no, I'm, I'm really doing, hi, I'm Clay. <laughs> <laughs> it's so funny because I totally had like a fangirl moment that I think I even disclosed to you. I was like, oh my God, I've heard your voice on like 12 different podcasts in two weeks. And now we're chatting via email. <laughs> it was cool. Yeah. So speaking of, that brings me to my next really awesome thing that I love about you is you are totally outside the box. And yet that as a fellow anomaly, I find that funny because when we're talking about, for example, online counseling, I mean, come on, the interwebs came out when we were like teens, which Uh still feels like forever ago. (laughs) Like, I'm like, oh, that was just yesterday. No, Tams, it was really like 20 years ago. Um, But so you'd think, you would think that our counseling industry would have jumped on that right away. But no, no, we didn't. I I am amazed that, and and, and I talked to somebody the other day that said that for the last 10 years, they've been saying this is going to take off. And it just hasn't. (laughs) But it just makes sense, doesn't it? That we now have the technology to see a person, hear a person through technologies like Skype and FaceTime, and and we'll get into the the reasons why you can't use those, but there are are Mm -hmm. technologies out there that you can connect with another human being that's in need, just like they're sitting in your office. There's some differences that a a, a therapist needs to prepare for. But, you know, I've got expats living abroad in Dubai and France, and uh, they don't have an English-speaking therapist nearby, or they don't have the time. I'm in Manhattan. I've got two or three guys that I work with that are downtown, and it would take them so long to get on the subway and come (laughs) to my office in Midtown that we do online counseling, just like they're in Jamaica or something. Um, Mm -hmm. And yeah, it's it's an incredible tool. I've talked with people in North Dakota, uh, Alaska, I just on, I did a podcast with somebody from Hawaii that, you know, it, like in North Dakota, it would take them two or three hours drive to get to the local town where there's one therapist that may not specialize in what they need. Right. Uh, so this is really meeting a need, I think. Oh my gosh, yes. And my experience mirrors yours because here in, I'm in the Panhandle and in Pensacola, right across the bridge to get to Pensacola Beach and the Gulf Breeze area in the summertime, forget it. That three mile bridge is backed up for two hours. So I can have clients five miles away and it would take them, just like if you were in New York, over an hour to get here. So I Definitely, I've got clients right here next door that I see online. And then I've had some South Africa, Ireland. It's been Tokyo. So fun. Oh, um, yeah. And as, as, a, as a small business person, I think that what that does is it expands your target audience to it's not just somebody uh, in your small town or in your city. It's, you know, the world is opened up now for people who are going to benefit from working with you. Totally. It's a two-way street. Now I have a much bigger pool of dream clients to work with and they get to find, as you put it, you know, the counselor that actually specializes in it. So you're not just stuck. And for some of my niches, that's tricky for people. Talk about polyamory, kink, spiritual abuse. Good good luck finding that, you know, in uh, Birmingham, Alabama. Yeah, (laughs) absolutely. So when you first moved into this market, because I mean, we, we just said that it's still supposedly kind of like an anomaly, which I'm hoping we're changing one clinician at a time. But I would imagine that a lot of people gave you funny looks, not only for the online stuff, but you do what is called walk and talk therapy. And <laughs> people are like, what? Oh, my God, Clay's leaving the office. And what's going on here? <laughs> yeah, I've always done it a little weird. 
I was an odd child. Um, <laughs> yeah, so I guess when, when I first I, I grew up in Kentucky, and my wife and I moved to New York in 1997. Holy and, crap, what a jump. Yeah, oh, yeah. <laughs> and, and so I needed to make money, and I had a little uh, private practice. And I had this guy in Wall Street that was having a hard time coming up to my office. And so my wife said, uh, well, why don't you just go to him? And, and I did that typical mansplaining husband. You know, <laughs> oh, I'm going to tell you why that's a thing. <laughs> oh, honey, silly, silly wife. And I couldn't explain it. I, you know, every little argument that I came up with, like, well, it's not here. I guess it's good. And, and that kind of triggered something for me going, all right, let's, let's think this through. And I actually offered it to him. I said, look, there's a battery park right next to you. We can meet there. It's a nice day. You won't have to commute. And we'll have the session there. And he loved it. I loved it. He, I've been working this, this guy for like six months. And he was stuck. And in the next few weeks, he started making movements, started making changes in his life, started thinking differently, and uh, just a lot of positivity and a reduction in his symptoms of depression, anxiety. So I'm like, okay, maybe I'm, maybe I'm onto something. So um, I threw up a website, got the domain name walkandtalk.com, tried to mm-hmm. figure out if anybody else was doing this, and there wasn't. And so I started offering it to uh, other clients. It kind of took off. And then one day I get this um, email from uh, somebody at the Wall Street Journal. And she said, hey, I just came across your site. Would you like to, you know, can I interview you? And so all of a sudden, little Clay is in this huge spread about walk and talk therapy in the freaking Wall Street Journal. Oh, my Um, God. And then some producer at Good Morning America read it. And now all of a sudden I'm walking through the park with Juju Chang on Good Morning America talking about walk and talk therapy and boom, I've got a private practice. Holy cow. What a story. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and did you have any idea that it was going to be received both so positively and so skeptically? No, absolutely not. In fact, you know, it's New York. You can't swing a dead cat without hitting three therapists. You know, everybody's got their, <laughs> everybody's got their dog walker, their trainer, their whatever, and their shrink. And mm-hmm. uh, so I needed something to stand out. So it kind of was not gimmick, but it was a way to stand out. But the more I did it, the more I actually believed in it. And uh, that this was a viable way for people to get in touch with their emotions. And, and I think it's, it's a metaphor for moving forward with your life. You're, you're walking and you're doing something. And, and I talked to somebody once and said, there, there are shower people and bath people. And I never understood, <laughs> <laughs> I never understood the bath people because you're just <laughs> sitting in your own filth. How is that getting clean? <laughs> oh, you got to do it the Asian way, Clay. You got to rinse off first. I guess, I guess. And so... So, but the idea that you're, you're kind of sitting on the couch or the chair in, yeah. in the therapist and you're sitting in your own muck, um, mm-hmm. there was something about movement and walking that people just started making uh, changes. And so, yeah, I started offering it to, to more and more people and, uh, you know, I think better on my feet and I think a lot of people do and, and I didn't expect it to, to take off, but it really has. And it's, it's been, um, it's, it's been wonderful. I love it. You anomaly, you. Well, the good news is that there is definitely a lot of research on this now. Thank God. I mean, mean, not as much as I would love, but there's great neuroscience on movement and how it unlocks things in the brain and how it absolutely, in my opinion, helps people process. Absolutely. I saw something the other day that exercise was, you know, on a par with Prozac for reduction of depression and anxiety. And yeah, that just makes sense. It totally does. I'm not, you know, people show up. It's a couple of times a, a new uh, client will show up with running shoes on and I'm going, mm, no, no, this is, <laughs> this is not exercise. I'm not running with you. I'm It'd not, be hard to talk. Yeah. So uh, we're just, just a casual stroll, but even that is, is something. No, it is. There's something about that bilateral stimulation and talking. I think it's very uh, cousin to like EMDR. Absolutely. And think about it. I mean, the, the ability to uh, create rapport with a client is that I'm matching their pace, their speed. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's amazing to kind of get that rhythm going. Um, mm. There's also men who sometimes have a hard time with eye contact. They yes. love this because it's not eye contact. We, we glance side to side, but you're really kind of looking forward. I had not thought about that, even though I do walk and talk therapy here and there. <laughs> That's very clever and true. Yeah. What are 
because I know mine, but I'm dying to hear from you. What are some of the like fears you hear from other people about you stepping outside your office with confidential clients? Yeah, it's it's uh, the big one was confidentiality. What if somebody saw me? And I always say, you know, I don't wear a hat that says walk and talk therapy <laughs> and back therapy in progress. Um, it's just two people walking through the park. Now, there, there are some things to think about. One is that I'm in the middle of Manhattan. I'm smack dab Central Park. There are thousands, hundreds of thousands of people around me. Nobody's paying attention. That's kind of a New York thing. Nobody's paying attention. Celebrities are all around you. We don't bother you. So that nobody, and I'm always cognizant if there's someone near us like that are that could overhear i'm i will move the the walking direction uh kind of so there's a lot going on for me as a therapist i'm i'm listening to you i am responding i'm coming up with the ideas but i'm also making sure that we don't hit the baby stroller and that that guy over there really isn't listening and because he's getting a little close and <laughs> I got to make sure that, that I'm on the route because 50 minutes I don't want to end too soon or end too late and there's a lot of stuff going on that doesn't have and doesn't happen in, in, in an office setting. Sure. I think even when I have, I've met clients outside the office at parks before, even ones that aren't walking, for example, I've had several handicapable clients. And mm -hmm. so we weren't really moving anywhere. I may have met at a Starbucks. And I think some of those certain same things come up. Um, but it's never been an issue. I just, oh. I don't know, maybe you're my brain are wired differently oh. than some other clinicians <laughs> in the field, but it just did not occur to me so much to worry. It's not that I'm out there rogue and being unethical, but I, it just, ne I never thought, I thought if the client wants this, what are we freaking out about? It's informed Absolutely. consent. Absolutely. And I, I talk about that sometimes. Many people in our field are a little precious about what we do. <laughs> At least. I don't want to be derogatory, but, no? but I've never had a client say, I'm worried about confidentiality. Mm -mm. Um, not once. So I, I, they just want somebody that's going to be able to help them and to empathize and to connect with them on such a, a core issue and be open and non judgmental. They don't care about the rest. The rest cannot be ignored. We need to care about the rest. We need to make sure that our file cabinet's locked and that nobody's going to see yes. our notes and all this other stuff. But they don't. So, yeah, I've never had a... The other... Oh, so to answer your question, the other uh, thing that I thought about that people have expressed concern is what about somebody that's um, ADHD, has attention deficit? How are they going to manage walking through a park with all the what? stimuli? Yeah. And... And it has never been a problem. In fact, my ADD people <laughs> they love do it. better. Oh yes. my God, they are so more. They they are a lot more focused in yes. a high stimulus uh, environment that than they are in a uh, office because the mind is just bouncing everywhere. Here, they're moving their body. They're right. able to focus and kind of you know dig in and do some good work. So the ADD people have never they they love it. <laughs> That's that to me was is usually someone who's a never really worked with an ADD population <laughs> or has just been I don't know watching too much Hollywood today because yeah yeah <laughs> I don't, like that's not the way the frontal lobe works my sweets that's no we're all good we're all good and I think <laughs> I think that the third one that people ask and always it's other therapists that ask right this, right <laughs> no no client has ever been concerned about this. But what happens when they have emotional overwhelm or they start, you know, break down crying? What do you do? And in the 10 plus years that I've been doing this, it has happened once or twice that a person has become a little teary or emotional. Mm -hmm. And we just pull off to the side and sit on a bench. And, you know, it's this idea that emotion happens in life. We have to be able to handle that. Thank you. In life. Yes. <laughs> Who hasn't been driving down the street and some sappy song suddenly had you ball like a baby? Maybe it's just me. Yeah. But I mean, you're in public or maybe you're out in Starbucks. You never had a weird thought. I I don't know. Yeah. So those are I think we over sanitize things. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I I, I do have the advantage of, of being in New York. I think that this model is is good for anywhere, really. I, I wonder about some small parks in, you know, I'm from Kentucky and I, I know that there's a, this great park in Louisville, but you go there in the middle of the day and you'll be the only person there. So if right. I was to meet a client that I wasn't familiar with in this, you know, abandoned park <laughs> in the middle of the day, nobody's going to hear me scream. 
Um, right. Yeah. You have to be smart. In the process, <laughs> but... We didn't check our brain at the therapy door. We promise. Yeah. That's <laughs> So I want to know, how did you, you have an interesting story. How did you even end up being this cool anomaly in New York doing therapy online and out in the parks? Oh, uh, were you like five and said, that's what I'm going to do when I grow up? (laughs) Kind of. Really? Yeah. I (laughs) No, not, not to the detail, but I always loved stories and I had mm. a grandmother and her sisters who would sit around and tell stories and they were fascinating and funny and inspiring and I would just I couldn't wait to go and be with them to hear their stories and and then you begin to think these stories define who they are and I just developed the ability to be a really good listener which is a big requirement and being a therapist, now that's not where it stops. You need to have now an education, but to have this curiosity and humanity and uh, to empathize and understand how stories define us and that, and that we can change those stories. So, yeah, I guess it started there, just really being a good listener. But I always felt like I was a fish out of water in Kentucky. Um, mm. You know, I, I remember on my wall when I was growing up were posters of New York and um Talk about you know, manifesting a future. <laughs> I ended up yeah. there. Um, I went to a small little college and thought, well, you know, and I did some acting. And if you're going to go into that field, you kind of need to be in New York. So we packed our stuff and had our little dream and went to New York. And I could be a bartender and, and audition at night or I could dust off this master's degree I got and actually open a private practice. And that seemed a little bit more lucrative. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it certainly is for us anomalies, I think. I just that's gonna be the word of today. Today's okay. podcast is brought to you by the word <laughs> anomaly. Because I'm sure just like I have, there are many that open the doors and and fail. This is not to be a depressing thing, but to talk about it's it's important to be authentic and passionate and stay true to you. Oh yeah. Of course. And, and this just seemed like a, it was a good fit. And we could pursue our dreams of, uh, yeah, I had two passions. I had passion of, of, of counseling and, and a passion of, um, of theater. And, and you see where that combines, it's stories. Story, it's, yeah. It's all about story. And um, so we started a theater company in uh, Jersey City, which is right across the river from Manhattan, We started a theater company and ran it for 10 years and um, really had a huge impact on our community. Some of the the, the scripts that we chose and I miss it. We lost our space a couple of years ago. So if anybody in New Jersey knows that you need a theater company, call me out. (laughs) Clay's got one ready for you. I've got it in storage. It can unpack it and we can do it in a month. (laughs) Speaking of unpacking, you have some good Trump session stories I hear. Well, I do. Now, my office is right across the street from Trump International Tower. No, no, Trump International Hotel. He's got so many buildings. Um, Uh If not the big one where he lives, which is Trump Tower on 5th, this is Trump International Hotel. So there's a lot of protests going on. And like so many people uh, on November 9th that woke up, and and I'll admit I live in my Manhattan bubble uh, of Mm -hmm. liberal people, um, and then, of course, I have my family back in Kentucky who are not liberal. <laughs> <And> we'll <laughs> I can just... relate to that, except we're, we're like two <laughs> cities apart. <laughs> yeah, okay, right. And um, you wake up on November 9th and go, what's going to happen? And, mm-hmm. and, and it's not just that moment. It was 18 months of a general election with the primary and the chaos that and, – and then we developed into this – news addiction and news as entertainment and that a lot of the important issues got lost and a lot of people got sucked into this and then on November 9th we go now what's going to happen we've we've elected uh, Donald Trump as president and since then the chaos still feels so the- weird to me I just gotta say that yeah. it's like I feel like I'm in back to the future or something I, um, I do I do it's it's I can't remember that moment in back to the future when he says something about President Reagan and yes. the, the guy says, you mean the actor? That's, exactly. that's who's president in 1984. So it's that kind of moment of, yeah, I can't get my mind around it. 
So, so many people came rushing in my clients in, in panic and anxiety and fear. And then I start reading on the mental health crisis and they started naming it Trump anxiety that a lot of mental mm -hmm. health professionals are having to deal with clients that are, are scared and on both political spectrums that the, the liberals feel like we're going uh, backwards into this fascist regime and all the progress that we've made is going to be thrown away. And the uh, conservative, the Republicans are, are feeling disrespected and that they're, they're voiceless. And, and now we've won. We should be making progress. And you all are just being snowflakes and, and complaining. And uh, mm -hmm. you need to get on board. And, and there's a lot of anger on both mm -hmm. sides, a lot of fear on both sides. So this is what I came up with. And we're launching this next week uh, at the online counseling directory. So I've asked my members to volunteer two free sessions to anyone who wants to uh, talk about this global political anxiety. And, and this is a global thing. There are people all over the world that are afraid of Trump. And, and it, sure. it started even before uh, Trump with the Brexit, that we mm -hmm. are, are going in a direction as a planet that is concerning a lot of people. So the members are, are signing up to volunteer to have these two free sessions. And the idea is it's um, really coping mechanisms, mm -hmm. teaching some basic anxiety reduction things. It, it's more educational than therapy. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, so we are uh, announcing this uh, Trump anxiety sessions. And you can, as a therapist, volunteer to give, you know, and, and you can take as many clients as you want. You just want to do one. OK, you'll have two free sessions if this one person. If you want to do 10, you can do 10. But the idea is to bring more people to the site and begin to help people reduce some of the fear that's just bubbling everywhere. Too cool. I love that. I uh, was listening to my other huge fangirl crush of Rob Bell, the Robcast. Oh, yes. And he did a series on this, on that thing in the air. <laughs> it was the Trump issue. Yeah. And um, he was bringing up a really good point that, you know, basically when this happens, yes, it's scary, but it also allows for, look at all the amazing incredibleness that happens in response to it. And so when, you know, the light workers end up basically kind of falling asleep, this is my Tam's paraphrase, mm -hmm. shit like this wakes us back up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I feel awake. I don't necessarily right? want to be awake all the time, but I definitely am going, I, I, I am awake. But it's, it's, it's nonstop. It's become a, 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 there was an SNL sketch a couple of weeks ago where the, the judges were on there. Did you see this? Where I the did. three judges, uh, Trump was suing somebody, Alec Baldwin. Mm -hmm. and, and one of the judges <laughs> says, I just want to wake up and not be scared to death with what new thing has come down the road. And I'm going, mm -hmm. I just want that. It's every day, every hour, some new thing is scaring the hell out of me. Right. And like you said, it's been intense on both sides. So what's interesting is that I've had conservative clients come in upset, feeling like they don't belong, even though... Mm -hmm. You know, there are persons in office, but they're like, I don't know even how to talk about this anymore. And then I've got certainly the rest of my clientele, the vast majority of them that are like, Tamara, oh, my God, like, you know, I worked so hard on not being afraid as a trans woman. And yeah. now I'm I'm petrified. What do I do with this? You know, absolutely. And it's frustrating. I kind of feel like the um, moment in Mr. in the Incredibles when Mr. Incredibles like, I just cleaned up this place. Can it not stay clean? <laughs> Five minutes. <laughs> like, not to devalue what we all went through, but it was like you've made all this progress with the client, you know, working on identity and authenticity and, and it's going to be okay to go out there and, you know, just do your thing. And then overnight, it suddenly wasn't. Oh, my God. Yeah. And you that know? was that was that, the, that theory of because all the polls were saying, you know, Hillary's going to win. It really wasn't. Mm -hmm. and we were kind of relaxed into it. Yeah, um, I thought and, she would. And talking about how in, in session for weeks leading up to that, that, you know, the justice prevails and that um, mm -hmm. it reminds me, I was doing adolescent substance abuse during the uh, O.J. Simpson trial and it was inpatient. So I got these kids that were, you know, I love my little druggy kids. 
Um, yes. And we were talking about consequences to choices. And they came out one day that the, um, the jury was back. We have a verdict. And I said, that's it. Everybody into the TV room. We're going to watch this. And it kind of talking about how uh, no matter who you are, there is justice and oh, then of course, no. oh yeah, so <laughs> brilliant <laughs> therapy moment. Intervention gone wrong. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and all these kids that are rioting, going, "What now? What?" Yeah, so yeah, that was not my best moment. <laughs> It's so hard. One of the biggest takeaways I've had was something that Rob Bell did address was the whole importance of a counter narrative. And he referenced like Martin Luther King Jr. And he was saying, you know, his I have a dream speech is the perfect counter narrative. You know, this is my, again, my Tam's paraphrase when shit gets real, because if he had just come out and been like, I'm against this and racism is wrong, everyone would have been able to tune him out. And yet here we are, how many decades later, still quoting it. The, we teach it in schools. We've got it printed on posters. Um, yeah. Wow. So I'm Pretty hoping cool. to hear some powerful counter narratives come out. And I think we're already singing it with the Women's Movement March and... Mm -hmm. Just people who never would have come together before are suddenly allies, and that's been neat to watch. Yeah, we, uh, my wife and I participated in the uh, the women's march in New York, and um, and I I'm not a marcher, so you know this is no, you're a walker. new for me. I'm a walker. <laughs> I'm not a marcher, and so to be surround and it was packed. I mean, you couldn't move. I saw your pics. It was amazing. Oh, it was so cool. But the, the moment that I got chills from was a, a, a rally, a, a chant started going out where the women would say, uh, my body, my choice. And then the men would echo her body, her choice. So to have chills these, just hearing that, oh my God. Oh, to hear these soprano, alto, female voices say, my body, my choice. And then the bass male voice say her body her choice in complete solidarity and support it you know i'm starting to cry just thinking about that no. it was beautiful it was beautiful that that more of that please that's what we're talking about <laughs> like what a cool experience for you and your wife and then to see the rippling effects outward like you oh, said yeah. here you are several months later still carrying that moment with you and mm -hmm. it's those that's actually one of the reasons why i love what you and i do as a living is because those moments happen in session all the time all that the time breakthrough connection moment like oh i can't even describe it <laughs> it's yeah. just, addictive <laughs> i have no problems crying not boohoo crying but if a client tears up i will tear up at times i mean oh, yeah it's We're i don't understand the clinicians that don't or try so hard to keep that blank slate i just i feel like we're missing out and yes that's my biases don't send me hate mail yeah. <laughs> <laughs> i'll own it <laughs> don't don't send me mail e either it's the biases of a strong existentialist and narrative, transpersonal, what the hell ever I am. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I can't even define that. They're like, what, what type of therapy do you offer? I don't know. Fucking awesome. I don't. <laughs> Please put that on your website. I'll pay you. I should. Off. I probably on would. Your <laughs> and you would, you would draw people just that. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking awesome. The end. I, I feel like I, I get pretty close sometimes with my anything but ordinary, um, which is what Aria means. So, Oh, I'm, yeah. I'm, I like that. Yeah. Do you have a separate site where you do like writing and acting in that more creative side of you? No. I mean, the theater had a site, um, but I don't have anything. I've got, you know, I've got three things. Damn. This is, this is <laughs> enough. I've got... <laughs> Walkandtalk.com. I'll just, I'll, shall I do a little shilling? Do it. Yes. Uh, Walkandtalk.com, uh, where you can come walk with me in Central Park or Battery Park. And then when I work online with couples is maritalcounseling.com. I'm into really cool domain Ooh, that names. was clever. Yes. And, and they are not cheap. Let me tell you, no. they are not Imagine. cheap. You get a good domain name. So maritalcounseling.com. And, and then I work with couples. Uh, all over the world uh, using technology. And then the, my, my big new passion is the online counseling directory, which is onlinecounseling.com. And uh, I'm going to be paying that domain name off 
forever. <laughs> but I thought it was, it, hey, it was available. And I'm like, you know, it's going to, it's what it is. It's online counseling. So, yes. um, so yeah. So, and that's been a huge challenge is the development of this directory because I'm a therapist. I'm not a web developer. And there were so <laughs> many things that we had to take into consideration. Like in you, what you're well aware of is that therapists mm -hmm. need to be licensed in the state where their client sits. So I can work with anybody in New York. If mm -hmm. somebody from Kansas comes, I can't work with you. Right. And a lot of therapists aren't aware of that but they they really need to be licensed in Kansas. So what we did is we created these filters to where if a client says, okay, I want a female therapist that specializes in depression and uh, familiar with the LGBT population, then they are asked, where do you live? And if they say New Jersey, then they're only going to get therapists that are licensed in New Jersey. It was a such a clever system, really. Thank you. It, it took a lot to kind of figure out those filters and make them work. And, and then to educate therapists about how to do this well. Because mm -hmm. a lot of people are just like, mm, I don't want to do this. This is scary. This is, I'm going to lose my license. This is, <laughs> what, what is this? No. Oh, let me, let me tell you this story here. So I, I developed this, this website, right? Big entrepreneur, Clay Cockrell going down. And, mm -hmm. and there's this uh, psychotherapy networker symposium. It's one of the largest conventions of therapists and counselors in the country. Most oh, yeah. And it's in D.C. And I thought, okay, this is going to be the launch. We're going to be ready. I'm going to go down there and get a booth and be a vendor. And they have all these vendors from, you know, the Rutledge. People are selling books. And you've got people selling, uh, like, uh, Theranest and uh, how to do yeah. online uh, your notes and your billing. And people with jewelry, people with things just for, for counselors. So um, I got a booth, onlinecounseling.com set it up. I had all these flyers printed out, spent a ton of money. Mm -hmm. My wife came down with me and we got this big corner booth right at the entrance at the vendor hall. Now the therapist nice. had been in session all day long, right? And then it opened up in the afternoon, the first day of the vendor hall. Turns out the session that they had just finished was titled The Dangers of Online Counseling. <laughs> this was the OJ moment all over again. Yes. <laughs> So they throw oh, open the doors. Oh my God. To the vendor hall. And there's my big banner, onlinecounseling.com, oh. with my big shit eating grin with my little flyers going, one <laughs> of the. <laughs> Christ, I'm a cracker. Oh. So, yeah, that was. Did you sell many that there, day? No. The, the looks of horror as they can, you know, a lot of them are the typical social mm -hmm. worker, counselor psychologist yep. you know they kind of stuck we, in the we office way up in the agency streamlined right. yep and and my wife who is this uh incredibly fashionable actress director and she's looking wonderful and after a couple of days of being there she said where do these people buy these clothes right <laughs> these people? i've been saying that forever every time i go to an apa or a sepa yeah. conference oh my god it's like we all subscribe to shapeless and drab are us or something i know so but there were some some hip people that actually sat and asked some intelligent questions and and we did eventually begin signing people up and now it's uh beginning to take off and uh we've got a new year-long membership that people can take advantage of so instead of paying month to month you can pay for a year in advance and you get a huge discount cool um, but our whole goal is to bring clients to your door or to your computer right what is not to love people <laughs> <laughs> we want you yes. to succeed and yeah and i'm gonna throw my hat in the ring on that one you are missing out like this is the wave of the future and not like the laser disc future <laughs> like <No>. this is <laughs> google's not going anywhere <laughs> it's really not it's really and not. i have clients who example, like you said, like they may not even be living in the same city or like one travels is so common down here, especially with today's economy to have men working offshore or out of the area with other, I don't know, like contracting gigs. I work with like contracting nurses sometimes. And so every once in a while, I'll even have one person who wants to still show up in my office. That's fine. You, typically the female, she was, they like the ambiance. I can't lie. And then we will, we don't Skype y'all. We'll get into that in a hot second, but we, 
will Zoom her husband who may be offshore in Louisiana. Right. Absolutely. I mean, it's the technology is there. Have, have you heard of um, Buck Black, the, the trucker mm-hmm. therapist? Did I tell you about him? Yes, and your other therapist. I was, I was just about to say, that sounds like a porn name. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry if you're listening, Buck, but Sorry, cool Buck. name. <laughs> it is a cool name, though. But you got to tell the story. The Buck story is a well, good one. He was one of the first people that um, that I had on the podcast. And I was kind of a fanboy, if you were, when I started looking yes. into other people that when I was starting to walk and talk and thinking other people who do therapy in an unusual way, I found Buck Plaque who is the trucker therapist. <laughs> Even you can go to, I know, right? Buck Black, the trucker therapist. And you can go to truckertherapy.com. Talk about a niche, right? I'm dying. It's so good. It's so good. He is amazing. And I followed him for years. And as soon as I started the podcast, I went, I got to have him on it. Because he, you think about truckers, they are away from their family. Right. And, uh, it's an incredibly stressful job. You're on the road. You've got all these drivers and uh, you, 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 sometimes you're not sleeping. There's a lot of physical problems um, yeah. and it's solitary. So, he's, you know, when you go for a, a niche market, he found one with these truckers and they, they love him. So, yeah. And so he, he, he does online counseling with these truckers all over the country. And that's the only way they can get, they can get it. It's getting true, counseling. True. They're on the road all the time. And for us all to say, mm, for us to be a little precious and go, no, it has to look like this. And you have to come into my office with my little plant. <laughs> and I right. That. And it's like, I, I, I know you're in pain and you need my help, but I'm not going to help you unless you do it my way. That's just not fair. I love that you call it precious. I usually call it white coat syndrome, but that totally works too. That's like the Southern, bless her heart. Aren't you precious? Aren't you precious? Yeah. Yes. And and somebody told me that there is one mental health professional in India for every 400,000 people. Oh, shit. That that might be a psychiatrist. It might be an RN. It might be a social worker. But um, India has two official languages, one being Hindi, one being English. They are technologically advanced. They are desperately in need of, of our help uh there's a suicide epidemic over there Mm. um so that's that's just india now let's talk about china and uh australia and you know the uk there are people in need of our services so i i I don't think it's ethical for us to say no you don't get it you gotta come to my right Right. Not to mention, like you said, like the, the niching of it all too. And to have force a client to have to start over and over and over again every time they pick up is just ridiculous. It takes so much guts to walk into a stranger's office and say, here's all my junk. And I'm afraid to admit it to anyone, but hey, you mm-hmm. seem like a cool person. And then I have to start all over again. Ugh, that's yeah. not cool. Yeah, it's yeah, it's not cool. And then the, the therapists that I talk to that want to retire or want to travel, that's the whole point that I started doing online counseling is, is we wanted to. Travel. Yes. So I take my client right now. I'm in Miami. I've been here for a month because I hate New York winters. Well, Just to go figure. Yeah, well, hey, neighbor, degrees. that's why I moved here in the first place. Yes. <laughs> right? yes. It's gorgeous down here. You're, welcome to the Sunshine State, Clay. I love this place. I was yes. in the ocean this morning. It's February. Yes. 20, it's actually March 2nd. I was in the ocean this morning. I can't believe Yes. That. So we wanted to, to travel. We went to Rome for six weeks. I lived in Rome for six weeks and I worked. I took my clients with me. They were on my mm-hmm. little laptop. And we went to London for a month. We went to Aruba for a couple of weeks. I get to travel and still work because as a private practitioner, if I'm not in my office, if You're I don't make do money, this, I'm not making money. Mm-hmm. So it really opens up and a lot of therapists want to retire and go to you know, Florida or Arizona or whatever, but still continue to work a little bit. This is a way that they can do that. Yeah. And it's something that you and I talked about before, I think on your podcast about why the hell haven't we caught up yet with the coaching industry? <laughs> like, oh, yes. Like, Hello. It's not that telehealth or mental health as, you know, a brand new idea here. Absolutely not. They are going to overtake us unless we get our ass in gear because people feel a little. I think they already have. Yeah, uh, they feel a little easier biased. going to talk to a life coach versus a shrink. A life coach right. is positive. A shrink is negative. It's disease right. oriented. It's medical. Life coaches, hey, let's you know change the world. And, and I'm all for them. I, I love what they do. But I know that what we bring to the table is really valuable, but we're limiting ourselves. 
and how. So now I'm putting you on the spot, but have you thought about doing both the way that me and a bunch of other people already are? (laughs) With, with coaching and therapy? Yes. Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. I do that. It just, I, you're going to give me another thing to go do. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I actually think who better to be a coach than someone that's already got the degree? Yeah, yeah, that's true. Like, that's yes, true. there are slight different set of skills ish, but I don't know on that. There are. There's a guy, Patrick something, and I think he's in Texas, that he teaches therapists how to take these wonderful skills that we have and mm. tweak them and approach them with life coaching, which is just a different muscle. But it's, you know, you, you have the empathy, you have the listening, you have the, the challenge, all that kind of stuff. So it's just coming from a different perspective. And he's got a, um, a, a training course that therapists can uh, learn how to be coaches. That's too cool. Um, I have actually partnered with a former PhD in the prison system and other, she was a, I don't think she actually got licensed, but she was, was a psychologist for many years on a university and then in a prison. And she made the jump to coaching like so many of us are, except she's full time. And she and I have actually paired up and started our own life coaching <laughs> to get really? our own life coaching training program. So it's oh. not necessarily for a therapist, but it's more geared towards those of us who love both the neuroscience and the woo. So we co-founded the Psych Intuitive Institute, and we are going through our first batch of future certified life coaches. Yeah, I'm excited. Wow. Yeah. I didn't know this. I know. Brand new, hot, off the presses, y'all. <laughs> That's incredible. Yeah, it's like one of my big passions is to really be, so the the coaching clients that I take on are typically other coaches, creatives, and healers in the industry. And so it's very difficult for them sometimes to find someone who's got the education beyond them or who can hold sacred space for them in a way that they do for their clients. And so it's a really cool niche, I think, that Ashley and I have. Dr. Ashley Greer, if you're listening, hello, girl, to be oh. able to not only teach coaches, people who want to be life coaches, how to do it while explaining some, not obviously it's not a grad school program, but we do cover the basics of the brain and how the stages of change and all that good stuff. And then because we're both also like intuitive healers, we cover the spiritual woo side as well. I love this. I'm, I'm checking this out as soon as I get off this (laughs) call. It's fun times. (laughs) So I think we're going to open up again in, in April. We're excited. Oh, All right. So, because I don't need to sleep, I can I can sign up for a new course and right. Well, business. I feel like I got like six hats. Clay, come on, keep up. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm so behind. <laughs> uh, no, my big thing is like trying to find balance these days, which I think is one of my last questions for you: is be when you are the anomaly and you do have this portfolio life, so to speak. How do you stay grounded and balanced? I don't know. <laughs> that was wrong. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I got nothing on that. I, <laughs> that was perfect. I got nothing. Uh, I can I can talk about what I, I try to do. Yes. Um, I, I try to. What are you drawn towards, Clay, besides I'm, floating in the ocean once a year? <laughs> yeah. Once a, I, um, I, I, I do exercise. I think that that's, that's incredible for, for stress relief. I write everything down. I get it out of my head. So I've got stickies all over my wall. Because if it's in my head, it's just bouncing around. So that helps. I try to put some boundaries around my time so that this is this is work clay and this is this is not work clay. So I'm going to turn off my phone. I'm going to turn off the computer and I'm not going to respond to email. To try to and I talk to my clients about getting in the driver's seat of your life because I, I too many times I get jerked here and jerked there and I'm I'm not in control. I'm not in the driver's seat. So, but as a um, entrepreneur. As a, uh, a, th- a therapist, and I- I'm learning. I'm I'm not good at it, quite frankly, and and I do get pulled uh, too many times and don't find that balance. But the thing that I I take comfort in is that I'm trying. Yeah, I'm aware that I'm out of balance and I got to do something different. So I keep trying, and yeah. I haven't hit on it yet. But you know, I'm going to keep going. <laughs> I'll find something. I so resonate with that. I actually just switched up my schedule again to change carpooling so that I could take my girls to school, bring them home from school. And then I I see 
actual in-person clients in between those hours. And then in between picking up the youngest and the oldest, I'm, I moved my workout to in between those times because otherwise it, it just was getting missed. And now it's a nice midday pick me up. Nice. Yeah. I heard the analogy the other day. I don't know if this is true. It doesn't matter. It's still a good metaphor that apparently when airplanes are flying and they're on autopilot that we're actually off course like 90% of the time. Yes, I have <laughs> but heard it's a that. Constant recorrection, which is what really yeah. resonated from what you were just saying. Mm -hmm. It's just always trying to take your, your temperature and going, all right, how am I doing? <laughs> and because if I don't, then I, you know, a month will go by and go, what the hell just happened? Um, <laughs> yes. you know, how the hell did I get here? <laughs> so true. <laughs> Try to uh, get that temperature once a day. Clay, I could talk to you for hours. Thank you so much for coming on. This has been so much fun. It's so good. It's it's rare for me to get to be the interviewee. And you look <laughs> so good at it. So thank you so much for thank having you. me. <laughs> thank you. For listening to the Undressing the Spirit podcast. I pray you found some inspiration and titillation today. As always, I am forever grateful for five-star reviews, comments, and subscriptions on iTunes and anywhere else you may be listening to this broadcast. Please note the information provided is not meant to convey professional, psychological, or medical advice. If you could use such services, I highly recommend seeking them out from someone you trust. To get in touch with me personally, please check out ariatherapy.com or talesfromatrapezoid.com. Until next time, everyone.